Okay. Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah? Fine? Okay. So, uh, thank you for being back. This is the second, the second installment of this uh, crash course on non-equilibrium non -equilibrium quantum, uh, say, thermodynamics of quantum processes. And what we did yesterday was basically focusing on, um, on these two objects, right? So on the work probability distribution, and towards the end of yesterday's, yesterday's discussion, we had a look at the characteristic function, the associated characteristic function. So the take home message from yesterday's discussion was that in this non-equilibrium framework, uh, work becomes a stochastic variable distributed according to this, um, to this probability distribution P of W. W is the actual amount of work that you are doing on the system or that the system is performing, and this is actually equal to the, the difference in energy uh, between the difference between the two outcomes of the uh, measurements that we, have, um, that we have performed yesterday in this so-called two-measurement process or protocol. Um, and on the, on the blackboard yesterday, we, um, we went through the formal derivation of this closed expression for the characteristic function of work distribution. Um, so just to somehow uh, refresh what the ingredients of this expression are, uh, rho g is the initial thermal state of my system. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to comment on this uh, in a second while uh, u is the time evolution operator induced by my, my Hamiltonian process. I remind you that in our framework, the environment has been detached from the system uh, right before starting the protocol itself, right? So right before performing the first measurement of my two-step protocol. Uh, u dagger is the emission conjugate of this time evolution operator. H is the Hamiltonian of my process and lambda is the, in general, time-dependent parameter that I change when I want to perform work on the system itself. And um, the way I'm changing lambda is completely, completely arbitrary. I'm not setting any constriction on that. I'm simply changing it from a value lambda naught to a value lambda tau, okay, in an arbitrary fashion. U is the uh, conjugate variable to work um, that enters into my into my, <coughs> into my characteristic function. Now, yesterday afternoon, um, at the question, after the question, question and answers uh, session, um, a couple of guys asked me about the assumption of initial thermal state for my, for my system. And, um, and this is, um, I mean, a perfectly meaningful, perfectly meaningful point that uh, the guys raised. Um, do I need, so the question is, do I actually need to start from an equilibrium state of my of my system, and the answer is absolutely no. I can start from any state, and that will be uh, absolutely legitimate and absolutely fine. Uh, the apparatus of uh, building up, no, designed to build up the work probability distribution would work with any, so would, would work the same, the same fashion, in the same way, um, regardless of the initial state of, of, my, of my system. Um, the only the only need for starting uh, from, from an initial thermal state is that, to some extent, it simplifies the calculation that I did on the, black, on the blackboard yesterday. And on the second end, um, on the other end, this, um, this assumption we are going to see it is, um, is very important for uh, fluctuation theorems. Okay, so and this is what we are going to see, what we are going to see in a second. Okay, so. This is somehow um, recapping what we, we have seen yesterday together, and we now, we now move forward. So the plan for, for the next 45 minutes, uh, at what time do we stop, um, Fabrizio? At, at, what time, at what time am I supposed to, to end up? Uh, 10 past? Okay, so 10 past, 10 past 12, okay. So um, what we are going to do in the next 45 minutes, 40 minutes, is to um, go together through what are called fluctuation theorems, very briefly, and then um, assessing a way, an op say, a, a protocol that allows you to gather information 
about these two quantities that we have, these two objects that we have in this slide. Uh, the probability distribution for work and, um, and the characteristic function. And then towards the end of today's lecture, we dig into what uh, Martin has anticipated this morning. So the implications, uh, or a brief discussion of Landauer principle and the implication of this framework for non-equilibrium thermodynamics for the exchange of heat. So we are going to open the box into which we have placed our system. Okay, um, let's start, right? So uh, again, these two objects you know, and you now meet two of the most celebrated uh, fluctuation theorems in this framework of non-equilibrium non -equilibrium thermodynamics. Uh, the so-called Yazinski identity and the Tasaki and Crookes identity, okay, or the Tasaki -Crook re uh, Crookes relation. Uh, let's try now to... Uh, yeah, so historically, Yazinski um, found the relation for the, classical, for the classical stochastic case, stochastic thermodynamics case, and Crookes derived this relation for, again, for a classical process. Uh, later on, and I think this paper is the generalization of Yazinski to the quantum case, later on Yazinski extended the, 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 um, the argument to quantum dynamics, and Tasaki, um, Tasaki proved uh, Crookes, the validity of Crookes relation also in the quantum, the quantum domain. Um, now, this is my take of it. Now, uh, I've met recently Al Tasaki in, uh, in Granada, probably at the end of J June, and um, he, t he told me you shouldn't call it Tasaki Crookes. What I did was simply to put together two papers, and I found, I found the relation, right? So I didn't do anything. He said the, the merit is all, is all on Crookes. I still think that um, the contribution was, in, was interesting and, and relevant. So. Uh, to me as well as for, for the community, John, no? So, yeah, it's, it's typically... Korshan, yes. In fact, that's what, that's what, that's what Altasaki says. So there is this paper by Korshan and, um, and another one, and Crook's one, that he put them together and he got the relation. So historically, these two relations were found for classical processes and later on extended to the quantum domain. Now, um, see, uh, anecdotes apart, let's try and, uh, and see what, what is the physics that these two relations um, entail. And then, very briefly, I'll go through a derivation, a very quick derivation of Yazinski identity, while I leave the derivation, uh, so the proof of Tasaki Crookes to you as, a, as an exercise. It takes, takes two, lines, two lines of calculations to, um, to do it. So, Yazinski, so um, let's have a look at this relation, yeah? So it's pretty, pretty, no, pretty elegant. It's, you know, an identity is nice. It involves the expectation value of an object. This object involves work, the work that you do on the system, the stochastic variable that we have introduced yesterday. However, um, it also encompasses an element of, of uh, say, exoticness, if you want. No? You have to take the average, not of the work itself, but the average of the exponentiated work. Right? So the left-hand side deals with this e to minus beta w. Beta, I remind you, is the inverse temperature set by the bath with which the system was in contact at the beginning of our process. Well, the expectation value of this quantity is equal to e to minus beta delta f. And delta f is the change in free energy of the system, right? So a uh, couple of points of, of, of notice. First of all, uh, this object, the change in free energy, you open, again, no, the, 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 usual, the usual standard books on thermodynamics, uh, change in free energy is defined between two equilibrium points, right, two equilibrium states of my, of my system. So uh, these entails that my system not now asks us that my system started from an equilibrium state should end into an equilibrium state, right? In order for me to calculate this quantity in a, in a, meaningful, in a meaningful fashion. However, as I said yesterday, and I, I, repeated, I repeated it briefly uh, five minutes ago, I'm not prescribing anything about the way I'm kicking the system, right? So I'm not putting any any constraint, any requirements on, on how gently or hardly 
we are pushing, we are pushing the system that we want to bring out, uh, that, that we want to, to let evolve. So uh, more, more generally speaking, my unitary evolution, so the unitary evolution that we uh, subjected the system to, can occur in finite time. So it's definitely not necessarily a quasi-static transformation, which will take an infinite amount of time. No, a very slow process that takes your system from an initial to a final configuration, leaving it a thermodynamic equilibrium every time, right? It's not necessarily like that. Which means that um, if I now borrow a standard cartoon that you would see in um, all of these papers on non-equilibrium non -equilibrium stochastic thermodynamics, both classical and quantum, well, um, say, if this dot represents my initial equilibrium state, right? So this is the thermal state at time t equal to zero, not the initial state that we have prepared in our protocol. And if this meaningless line means not the evolution induced by my unitary process, right? This is the kick that I'm doing uh, to the system that I'm, say, subjecting the system to. In principle, and this observation was also somehow hinted at by, by Fabrizio yesterday, I end up into a state rho, a time tau, right? So the arrow of time is here. This is the final time of my of my experiment, this is the initial one. Can you see it? Yeah, guys? Down there? Yeah? Or up there? Yeah? Fine? Um, in principle, there is no guarantee that this state is the equilibrium state at time tau, right? So there is no guarantee uh, that this state is an e to minus beta h at time tau over the partition function at time tau, yeah? Why should it be like that? I'm kicking the system and I'm doing it in an arbitrary, in general, an arbitrary way. So I could be doing it very, very abruptly or extremely gently. It's still allowed, right? So it's, it's both cases, both, both sides of the spectrum of kicking, so to say, um, are encompassed by the framework that we have, we have illustrated yesterday. So this means that um, there is a, an equilibrium state somewhere in this abstract and stupid space of states that differs in general from the final state of my evolution. Well, this change in free energy, this object delta F, right? This change of free energy is defined between these two points, okay? So it's the change in free energy between the initial equilibrium state of my system and the hypothetical equilibrium state of my system that would be reached by a perfectly adiabatic, so quasi-static transformation. Make sense? Yeah? So I'm dealing with three enemies here. The initial state, the final state, the true final state of my evolution, and the hypothetical equilibrium state of the system at time tau. The change in free energy is defined between these two guys. It doesn't involve rho tau. Because I cannot use rho tau. Rho tau is a non-equilibrium state. It doesn't make sense to use it to, to calculate a free, a free energy change. So the right-hand side of Yazinski, it's a fully equilibrium statement, right? Involves quantity well-defined at equilibrium, that's it, full stop. The left-hand side, on the other hand, well, I mean, I'm taking the average of a quantity, right? So I, I don't need to do that, but I'm just re, say, um, writing explicitly what this quantity is, right? So this is e to minus beta w, the forward probability distribution for work, dw, right? So I'm taking the average, please. I apologize, I, I'm deaf, I didn't hear you. What? What average? What average? Uh, what temperature, sorry. Uh, yes, very, very relevant question. Is the same temperature 
of the initial bath, of the bath that I've used at the beginning of my protocol. So somehow, Yarzinski is um, hiding under the carpet the assumption of an isothermal transformation. Okay? Uh, I preempt the question, can I go beyond, beyond this assumption? The answer is yes. And um, I, can, I can look at transformations that are not isothermal as well and come up with um, modified different alternative versions of fluctuation theorems. And tomorrow we will see, we would see also different quantifiers of irreversibility based on, on this fluctuation theorem. Okay. Ah, very good, um, very good. The answer, I, I, okay, the answer is to some extent yes, uh, but the framework becomes extremely more involved. And in general, what happens is that you have um, a fluctuation, uh, say a fluctuation theorem with a correction term. So these two terms stay there, are there in principle, but you have to add another term here to this right hand side that accounts somehow for the exotic nature of your, of your, of your bath, okay? So the answer is a partial answer, and I, can, I cannot go more quantitatively uh, than, than what I said, but the answer is that some, to some extent you can treat non-equilibrium non -equilibrium environments. Um, I think an explicit case was um, recent, a recent one, is a paper by Parrondo, Zambrini, and someone else, uh, which I don't remember. They are looking at an harmonic oscillator, so a non-equilibrium process of an harmonic oscillator in coupled to a squeezed, to a squeezed bath, okay? Um, and they derive the explicit form for the uh, fluctuation, the corresponding fluctuation theorem. Okay, so if I can go back to that, uh, this is the left-hand side of my fluctuation theorem, which means that uh, I have to account for the probability distribution for work. And this probability distribution for work encodes the in principle non-equilibrium nature of my transformation, right? So in general, yes, Martin. The, the average is, of, of course, encompassing all the possible, all the possible uh, trajectory connecting the initial to. <sighs> the probability distribution accounts for all of the all the all the dynamical trajectories, no? Because it puts together all the possible all the possible processes, say all the possible. Uh, transition probabilities connecting your initial equilibrium state to any to the to the to the to the to the state that you reach at the end of your of your of your dynamics. Let's 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 look into that later on. So it, I think it, is that clear so so far? Yeah. Okay. So I have something that is explicitly encompassing the possibility for non-equilibrium, and something that is defined at equilibrium. So what, is telling, what this relation is telling you is that uh, on average, right, so the, that quantity e to minus beta w, right, would be entirely determined by equilibrium p properties of my, of my, of my, uh, of my system. The non-equilibrium nature of my process gets washed out somehow by the average, and uh, what, I, what, what matters are the equilibrium properties defined between um, this initial state and the hypothetical, hypothetical one um, that I will reach by a quasi-static transformation. Second relation, so the tasaki crookes one, on the other hand, uh, is a little less, uh, little less intuitive, no? And introduces explicitly the backward process, the process that we, um, yesterday I entered at, uh, but we didn't, we didn't go into, um, into in detail. So we know already what PFW is. What is this PB of minus W? This is the analogous probability distribution, but for the backward process, okay? For the process where 
instead of starting from this initial state and evolving, so to say, according to this um, no, evolution, and for ending up at my, at my final state tau, the backward, pro the backward process is the one where I start from the equilibrium state of my final Hamiltonian, evolve according to the time reversed uh, unit, say evolution operator towards a new final state. Does it make sense? Yeah? So this time, so this is forward, so to say. And the backward one, the backward one would entail the preparation of an equilibrium state of the final Hamiltonian, precisely this object, time reversed, no? with, the, with the application of the time reversed opera or reversal operation to it. The evolution according to, uh, well, I shouldn't do it, I shouldn't make it too similar to the previous one. Okay, the evolution, well, why not? The evolution according to the uh, time reversed process, and the, uh, no, which will bring you, which will lead you to another, another final state, right? So at, associated to this process here, there is a probability distribution PB of W, which you can define in, a, in an, an analogous way to the PF that you have there. No, you have to account for the transition probabilities um, no, from, from a given eigenstate of the final Hamiltonian, which now becomes the initial one, to, no, to eigenstates to eigenstates of the uh, formerly initial Hamiltonian, which becomes now, now the final Hamiltonian for your backward process. So what uh, the second crooks are telling you, are telling us, is that, uh, say, the probability of performing work in the backward process is somehow exponentially suppressed by a quantity that depends on W, the stochastic value, no, the, the variable that the value that that variable takes for, for that specific trajectory and the change in free energy. <clears throat> these are, uh, for those of you that are interested in irreversibility, these are very nice implications uh, for um, the concept of time, time reversal. No? So it doesn't seem to be symmetric. It doesn't look like a symmetric statement when you, when you, reverse, when you reverse time. You pay in a different way. The forward and backward process allow you to pay in different ways. OK, uh, these two relations are say, very elegant, extremely, extremely nice. By the way, you can uh, rephrase them uh, in terms of the characteristic function for work distribution in a, pretty standard, in a pretty easy way. And we are going to see it in a second. Okay? So given that uh, PF and KF have the same, uh, say, predictive power, so to say. No, they contain the same, the same information on the process itself. Um, you can restate these two, these, these two relations, these two identities in terms, in terms of chi. Okay. So now, uh, in a minute, let's try and and have a look at how we can indeed make sense of of the Yarzinski identity um, in a in a in a forward in a formal way. Okay. So. Um, What I need is um, that quantity. Oh, why, why don't I write? Why don't I use it here? Right. So what I need is this quantity. Now, if I want to evaluate this left hand side of the Yazinski identity, what I need is this left hand side, this, this quantity here. And now, what I um, what I want to do is to notice the similarity between uh, the quantity e to minus beta w average and um, the characteristic function for work distribution, no? So if I, if I look at the characteristic function for work distribution, I have that if I replace u with an i w, right? So if I calculate chi f, sorry, no i w, i beta, if I look at chi f of i beta, chi f of i beta is precisely integral of minus beta W, PF, W, DW. Yeah, trivially. So, chi of I beta is precisely the expectation value 
of e2 minus beta w. Let's dig a little bit more into what chi of i, of I beta is, because I have a, not in this slide, but uh, what we did yesterday and what was in the previous slide is that chi of u can in general be written as the trace of um, u e to minus i u h naught times my um, equilibrium state at time t equal to zero, which I'm calling e rho eq naught times u dagger times c to i u h final. Guys, can you still read it? Yeah, are you okay? Yeah, okay. Now, um, I want to replace here u with i beta in order to work out an, another expression for this quantity, right? So, chi of i beta, according to this expression, will be trace of u e to uh, beta h naught, rho equilibrium zero, u dagger, and then I have e to minus beta h final. And now what is the equilibrium state of my initial Hamiltonian, so I write it here, is e to minus beta h naught over the initial partition function. So I can plug it into, into this expression. Again, I, I do something, something that I shouldn't do. No, I'm, I'm doing it on this expression, okay? So I'm deleting this guy and um, replace it with e to minus beta h naught over zeta naught. And of course, z naught is a number, so I can take it out of my, of my, of my trace. And then I, what I do is that I, um, I can notice that um, this object and this object simplify with each other, no? There is h naught in both, so this expression just gives me a one over zeta, zeta naught trace of u, u dagger e to minus beta hf. My process is unitary, so these two guys cancel, which I give me the identity, so I get the trace of e to minus beta h final, which is the definition of the partition function for the final, for the final Hamiltonian. With the, what do you mean with the wrong? Well, yeah, this is precisely the ZF, no? Oh, right. yeah, no Correct. So ZF over Z0 is what I get. <clears throat> and now, uh, group picture, shall I, shall I leave it? Yeah? And now, by definition, the free energy is defined as 1 over beta, d log of the part corresponding partition function. So what I, what I have is that the free energy at time tau is this object. The free energy at time 0, given that I'm still at the same temperature, is this object. So I can get, no, I take the exponential left and right hand side, and what I get from, from these two conditions, from these two equations, is that the ratio between Zf and Z0 is precisely the exponential of minus beta times F tau minus F0, which is my delta F. So on one end, the characteristic function, and this is still chi F, eh? so I forgot to put the, the label there. Uh, the characteristic function at i beta is given by the C to minus beta delta F. On the other hand, chi F of I beta is equal to the expectation value of uh, E to minus beta W. So you put the two th things together, you get, you get Yerzhinsky. From this non-equilibrium, starting from this non-equilibrium framework and the two measurement protocol uh, that, we have, um, that, we have, that we have used. And um, when I said 
For Yazinski, it is actually very important to start from an initial equilibrium state. Well, you can appreciate it from, from here, from my undue, uh, undue passage, right? So the passage that allowed me to replace this guy with uh, my, my um, E to my Gibbs distribution, no? Okay. So, so to say, uh, I mean, these are not the only, these are not the only, the only statements, the only fluctuation theorems that you can, you can, you can draw. There are other versions, but uh, historically and also somehow, um, um, operatively, these are the two that are most celebrated and, and, and um, somehow very useful for um, considerations that we are going to, we are going to make later on, uh, later on tomorrow. Okay. Uh, I would like to raise one point, no? And the point is the following. Um, so it's actually not my own question, but it's a question that was, was raised by uh, some of the people that came up uh, with the paper that we commented on, about, um, upon yesterday, no? So um, fluctuation theorem work is not unobservable. So, so the basic group, the Augsburg group, uh, these people say um, pointed at, 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 something, at something that was uh, right before your, your, your eyes. So the fact that um, it is, in general, difficult to um, infer the probability distribution for work, the characteristic function, so to get the statistics of this non-equilibrium quantity is, is in general, a tough, a tough, um, a tough, score, a tough uh, goal. And um, in this sentence, in this paper, in this review paper, uh, they claim that, say, the major obstacle for the experimental observation, verification of the work fluctuation relations, um, is posed by the necessity of performing the projective measurements of, of, of energy. And also, in the two measurement process, you have to measure on eigenstates of two different Hamiltonians, non-commuting Hamiltonians, at the beginning, in general, at the beginning and the end of, of your of your, uh, of your process. And, um, and if you think about, you know, this, say, somehow the paradigm for a, for a working medium, which is a complex system, you know, in general, for instance, a many body system, right? And if you want to, you know, think of a gas. And if you want to export that into the quantum domain, um, you might have to project onto uh, many body, in general, entangled states of, of, of this, of this complex, complex working medium. So it might be on its own a very difficult, a very difficult task to, uh, to accomplish. And the uh, truth was that, truth is that um, up until a few, a few years ago, um, there was a substantial body of experimental work on the classical verification, so the verification of fluctuation relations at the classical level, but very little, very little done on, um, at, at, the quantum, at the quantum level experimentally. Uh, theoretically, there were proposals. There were a few, um, um, say, most noticeably one, one by, by uh, the group of Eric Lutz and Schmidt Kalle, um, dealing with trapped ions, trapped ion technology. So, precisely this, the context that uh, was illustrated yesterday by, by uh, Christoph. Um, yet, I mean, the proposal, the proposal. Um, they brought about some difficulties, was, was rather, rather, rather involved, um, a bit far for, from, from what they could do at that time in the lab. And um, it did see light in a way or another, not in a, in a, in a say, uh, changed version uh, more recently by a, by a group, by a, Chinese, by a Chinese group. But until a few years ago, um, there was no, basically no verification of fluctuation theorems at the quantum level. And the difficulty was precisely put your hands on the probability distribution for work or the characteristic function. So um, how can, so the question I want to, to raise is how can we um, reconstruct for a given process, how can we reconstruct the work probability distribution um, for a general process, for a general process undergone by a, by a, quantum, by a quantum system? And the answer, or one, a possible answer, a possible answer comes from this, um, from this key. Okay, from this um, uh, diagram. Now, I don't know how many of you are familiar with quantum circuits, but we are going to, to uh, I'm trying to illustrate what uh, the ingredients of this circuit are in a second. Um, 
So let's have a look. I should stress this is not the only way of putting your hands on the characteristic function of work distribution or on the probability distribution for work. In fact, I say another, another case that you might be interested in um, is provided by, by the group of Juan Pablo Paz in Buenos Aires, where um, they made a very, nice, a very nice observation, which is that um, the two measurement protocol that I have illustrated yesterday can be actually understood in terms of a single a generalized measurement performed on the system. So not a projective measurement, but a generalized measurement. And they come up with a protocol for the um, inference of the probability distribution by starting from that viewpoint, from that, from that standing point, okay? So we are sticking with the two measurement protocol in this, in this in, say, as far as this slide is concerned. And um, this is the way, the proposal for um, the reconstruction of the characteristic function of work distribution. So uh, for those of you that are used to quantum optics, uh, you can understand this guy easily in terms of a, of a very standard, I mean, very, very uh, basic interferometer, uh, nothing, nothing, nothing else. Uh, this is actually a phase inference protocol or, or, or circuit, nothing else, phase estimation protocol. So what do we have here? Uh, S stands for my system. Okay, so the system upon which I want to perform work, right? So it's the guy that I've kicked so far, so to say. A, A is someone, um, is, a, is, a, is a secondary system, um, which we call an ancilla, okay? So an helper, huh? someone that helps, helps us performing a given, a given task, yeah? So um, from, this viewpoint, from this point on, I'm not just focusing on my system, I'm, I'm looking at the system and the second subsystem that will help me reconstructing the probability distribution, actually the characteristic function for, for work distribution. And the general underlying assumption is that um, I can do anything on the ancilla. I have the freedom, the luxury, so to say, to prepare it in any state I want um, and to measure it, to measure it uh, on any basis, okay? So I can do what I want on the system, right? I also have, uh, say, allowing myself the capability of engineering this object, this weird object, G, okay? So besides the exotic uh, drawing that you have there, G is nothing else but a joint, joint unitary evolution. So it's a unitary operator that combines the degrees of freedom of my system and the ancilla. So this is a unitary operation that lets the two guys interact, okay? Makes the two guys interact and evolve in time. On the other hand, H here, now these two guys is not for the Hamiltonian, no, stands for what is called a Hadamard, Hadamard gate. A Hadamard gate is again, uh, is a transformation that allows us to uh, create superpositions of logical states of a, of a, uh, Qubit. So here I'm assuming that my ancilla, for convenience, that my ancilla is a simple two-level system, okay? So uh, A, A lives in a Hilbert space whose dimension is two, okay? So I, I, I only have two, two logical, logical states, and I'm labeling them as zero and one, okay? Precisely as uh, Martin did. H, what H does is that it acts. It acts on zero and transforms it into a superposition of zero and one. And what he does on one is that he prepares the orthogonal superposition. And this is called Hadamard transform. Okay. So um, what I'm doing here is that I'm starting from a fiducial state, right, from a state that I know I can arrange easily in the lab, and I create one of such superposition. I create zero plus one for convenience, okay? Of course, you can replace these all 
uh, first block here with this, the preparation of this date only, and that's, that, will be, that will be perfectly, perfectly fine. And then what I do is the following. I prepare my system S in the initial thermal state that I was interested in, or in the initial state that I'm interested in, in case I don't need a thermal state, right? So S is prepared independently on its own initial state, and after I created coherence in the state of the ancilla, I let these two guys evolve together in a suitably, I mean, in a, in a specifically arranged manner, okay? So let's have a look at what G is. And I'm writing explicitly the fact that G depends in general on the time tau, no? my, my, uh, my fi my, my, my time, the time of my evolution, and on the variable u, the tensored in my characteristic function, right? So this is the conjugate variable to work. So let's have a look at what G does. Suppose that the ancilla is prepared in zero. Suppose that the ancilla is in the zero state. Then if the, the ancilla is in zero, then the system evolves according to this part of G. Suppose that in, on the other hand, the ancilla is prepared in one, then the ancilla, uh, sorry, the system will evolve according to this other bit of my, of my joint, joint operation G. So uh, in a even more cartoonish fashion, right, uh, what I'm doing is that I'm splitting, no? so this initial point is put together system and ancilla, right, each prepared in its own state. After the other mat gate is as if I'm performing two different evolutions of the system depending on which logical state the ancilla is in, right? So if the ancilla is in zero, then the system will evolve according to u e to minus i u h i. And if the system, uh, sorry, if the ancilla is in one, the system will evolve, again, this is the system only, the system will evolve according to um, e to minus i u h final times u dagger, no, times u itself, yes. So here I need the initial Hamiltonian, here I need the final Hamiltonian. And then what I do is that I do again an Adamant transform. Uh, I redo my Adamant transform. What this second Adamant transform does, I mean, it's completely immaterial, but it's simply, it's there simply because, because it's nice, so now, is to recombine, not letting interfere these two paths, these two evolution path at the end. So it's just like um, some form of interferometer that people, for instance, in quantum optics labs would implement, in optical labs will, will implement, in inner optics lab will, will implement. So the system evolves into different manners depending on the state of the ancilla. At the end of the protocol, and this is the nice part, I don't care about the system. I discard the system, I don't, I, I don't even look at it, right? So here you can put your bin and throw the system into the bin. So um, mathematically speaking, I trace out over the degrees of freedom of my, of my system. And what matters is only the ancilla. So what I do is that I measure, I try to reconstruct the state of the ancilla. And if the ancilla is just a qubit, that is a pretty standard, uh, pretty standard uh, operation to perform into the lab, okay? So I can reconstruct with, with uh, experimental uncertainties, but I can reconstruct with some, some, um, some uh, somehow, um, um, confidence the state of the ancilla. So I'm bypassing somehow the uh, problem of inferring the properties of the system into the reconstruction of the state of the ancilla. In some cases, this might be an advantage. In particular, if the dimension of my ancilla is, is low, right? Okay, so uh, five, we have five minutes before, before the lunch break. Yeah, is the lunch break from now? No, there's an, another, oh, there's Christoph lecture, yes. So in these five minutes, I would like to um, go through the calculation that allows us to, to sh that allows me to show you that at the end of the protocol, or maybe I'll just bypass it and you believe me, and uh, you trust me, and if you're interested, we can go into, 
into the details together. So uh, at the end of the protocol, so when I discard the state of the system, when I don't look at the state of the system and I reconstruct the state of the ancilla, I notice that the state of the ancilla in the basis zero of zero and one, in the basis of zero and one can be written in this manner. So let's write it explicitly as a matrix. Um, I don't need this diagram. So if I want to write down this density matrix rho A, what I find is that it takes is a two by two matrix because I have, I have only, I've assumed that my, my ancilla is just, is just a qubit. And what I have is one half here on the diagonals, and this is the identity, right? Then I have this quantity, no, this, this Pauli matrix sigma z times alpha, and alpha is the real part of my characteristic function. So what I have here is a real part of chi over two, and minus real part of chi over two. While on the off-diagonal elements of the, of the density matrix, I have a beta, unfortunately, sorry guys, uh, 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 this might be confusing. Here beta is not the inverse temperature, but is the imaginary part of the characteristic function, sorry. Uh, I'm noticing it here after three years, sorry. So here I have minus i over two, the imaginary part of chi, and i over two, the imaginary part of chi. Okay, so the state of the ancilla, the state of the ancilla encodes information on the characteristic function. If I reconstruct what is called the, say, the longitudinal magnetization, which is the expectation value, no? basically of sigma z, and the transverse magnetization, which is the expectation value of sigma y, I have full information on the characteristic function for work distribution. So by simply acting on the ancilla, by simply reconstructing the state of the ancilla, I would be able to get full information on a protocol that is arbitrarily complicated. So u is given there, no? I don't, when I implement this object, I don't have to worry about what u is, u gave it to me, yeah? Make sense? So no matter how abrupt my process is, how violent my process is, or how gentle the kicking is to the system, so no matter how um, strong are the non-equilibrium features of this guy, I will be able to reconstruct them through this procedure. Okay, so, and this um, has been used uh, in a couple of experiments that were aimed in the quantum domain at inferring the, uh, character, say, the, statistical, the statistical properties, the, say, the non-equilibrium properties of, um, of, a quantum, of, a quantum, of a quantum system. Okay, so um, I think I'm, I'm on time. Uh, Fabrizio, yeah, should I, stop? should I stop here, right? Yes, it's 10 past 12, I'm done. I think I'm, 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 I can stop here, so uh, it's a good time for, for getting. Um, yes, I think, I, think, I think they are. Um, it's, a, it's a physical state, so it's a legitimate, it's a legitimate state. I mean, uh, no, 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 no. Uh, Kai uh, enters as a, basically as a phase in your, in your, in your state. Um, Yes, uh, in fact, say if you, okay, just if I can add, if you avoid the second Adamard then you write everything in, on the basis of Z of plus and minus, it's a lot, a lot more clear so that, that chi appears as a, as a phase on it, okay? Yeah, I'll stop here and um, questions?